Chapter three, Me Familia. Some backstory about my family. Warning, love, loss, and homesickness ahead. My mother and father loved Columbia. Moving to the United States was not their original plan. Mommy, the fourth eldest of seven, was raised in Palmyra, a country town in the Coco River Valley. The land is gorgeous, warmed by the tropical sun overhead. Linens hang from clotheslines. Farmers with carts of fresh mangoes, plantains, avocados, and papayas line the dirt road leading to the main square. Locals bike to and from their jobs as field workers or as plant workers, civil servants, fishermen, maids, and cooks for the wealthy. In the evenings, as dusk turns into darkness, families share their meals and stories. As impoverished as many Colombians are, nearly a third of residents live in poverty. They've maintained a spirit of optimism and strength. My mother's parents clung to their hope. They lived without indoor toilets and electricity, many basics um, many of us take for granted. Yet they held on to their desire to give their kids opportunities. For three decades, they worked their fingers to the bone, harvesting sugar cane in the fields. They used their income on their kids' schooling. Two of my mother's siblings are college educated. My uncle Pablo was a school teacher. My uncle Carlos trained as an industrial engineer. Yet in Colombia, going to college doesn't necessarily bring you opportunity. Those who are born into power stay in power. Those who are born into poverty stay impoverished. This can be true in America too, but it is even more intense in Colombia, where there are far less money to go around. It doesn't matter how admirable one's work ethic or education is. For those who don't come from money, it's almost impossible to break into a new life. Nonetheless, my brave mommy with her generous outgoing spirit set out to become a teacher at age 17. While completing her study, she fell in love. She left school married and became pregnant. Then during the first few months of her pregnancy, she made a crushing discovery. Her husband was already married and had another family, one he'd hidden from her. Mommy was completely shattered. Alone, she wept until in August 1976, doctors delivered my brother. It was just Eric and my mom then, my dear Poppy, who grew up a few streets over from Mommy and Palmyra survived his own heartaches. He was 14 when his father died suddenly from an aneurysm. Right then, the carefree joys of childhood flew out the window. Still coping with the tragedy, he was forced to find work to support his family. He, the seventh of eight children, began picking beans in the fields while he was still in school. More sadness followed. Several months after the funeral, Poppy's mother tragically passed away in a bus accident. Now orphaned, my father had no choice but to set aside school and work full time in the fields. His siblings, my aunt Lusani and aunt Tenda, eventually became teachers. My uncle went on to work as a clerk. Like my mother, my father grew up with so little, yet made the most of what he had. My parents didn't know each other as children, despite living nearby. They met in their 20s. In those days, my mother's family was known in the neighborhood for throwing dance parties. My father went to one where he noticed her shining smile. She was the best dancer in the room. By then, my father already had a reputation as an amazing salsa dancer. He was so cool. His sister had been a seamstress, always made him fly outfits. Around town, people called him Chino Pinta, which is slang for well-dressed. My mother already knew of him and had a crush on him from afar. He was as handsome as he was, charming and reserved, a perfect balance for my mother's outgoing personality. In a nation where safety and stability can feel out of reach, love made their lives more bearable, even sweeter. Together, they struggled along on their small paychecks. Poppy worked from dawn until nightfall at the sugarcane plant, while Mommy worked for a bus company called Palmyra Express. My parents had been with each other for only six months when Mommy experienced more misfortune. Her younger sister was killed by random gunfire. Then exactly one year later, my mother's mom suffered a heart attack. Your grandmother died of a broken heart, my mother has often told me. Those tragedies shook mommy to the core of her being. Her love for Eric and my father is what kept her going. She yearned to escape from the despair all around her, to start over, 
someplace else. She prayed her son, my brother, would have a better life, one that was free of the tragedy she and Poppy had suffered. An idea sparked in mommy's head. Years later, her older sister, Milena, had moved with her husband from Columbia to Pasick, New Jersey. They'd been granted permanent residence. Mommy, who had visited my aunt many times now, saw opportunity there. And best of all, she saw a place far, far away from our painful losses. We should go stay with my sister and get on our feet, Mommy told my father. At first, Poppy, always careful, wasn't convinced that going to America would help. But deep down, he couldn't help admitting that it was just a super intriguing idea. They desperately needed money and a fresh start. So in 1981, with all their belongings stuffed into two suitcases, they arrived in New Jersey on a visitor visa that would allow them to stay for 90 days. It was the kind of visa that was the easiest for them to get because they were invited and hosted by family members who were there legally. My dad had his doubts. My mother planned never to look back. America wasn't initially the dreamland my parents thought it would be. Though with the help of family and friends, they eventually hustled up some part-time jobs. Let's see if we can make it work, mommy told him. Though they had little money, it was far more than they could make in Colombia. Poppy reluctantly agreed, but he was bothered by the fact that after those 90 days, they would be in a country without legal documents. He hated living with the fear that without warning, they could be deported. If he had to leave, he wanted it to be by choice, not because he had been kicked out. There was one thing they saw eye to eye on without question. Somehow, some way, they needed to get citizenship or legal permanent residence that would allow them to stay. They'd grown to love this country and longed to call it their homeland. One year stretched into five. They still had just enough cash to keep themselves fed and clothed. By 1986, they had what they've told me is their proudest accomplishment. Me. Not much else had gone right for my parents, but humble brag, I was right 100%. I was tiny when our family moved from New Jersey to Boston. You'll be able to find more work there, a friend had told mommy. It's a great place to raise kids. In January 1987, on the eve of a big snowstorm, Poppy loaded everything we had and we set out for the four-hour drive. Ahead of the trip, my parents had managed to set aside a bit of savings. On the morning we moved to our apartment in Hyde Park, my father had handed the landlord a neatly stacked set of bills, just about everything we had. At least our rent was covered, for the first month anyway. Like all families, mine has hashtag drama. For starters, Eric and Poppy did not get along, particularly once my brother reached adolescence. At the age of 15, Eric found himself in a dark place. It can feel impossible to dream big for yourself when you don't have the legal papers required to work or vote in the place you call home. Or when you're reduced to being an illegal in the minds of others. As smart as Eric is, he can kick it with the best of them at math and English. He lost interest in school. His grades slipped. He stayed out past curfew with his girlfriend, Gloria. Where were you last night? Poppy asked Eric one Sunday morning when my brother trudged into the kitchen. I, then seven, was eating a bowl of cereal. Mommy and Poppy were seated with me at the table. Eric didn't look at my father. None of your business, he mumbled. My mother and I traded a glance. Uh-oh. It takes a lot to rile up my reserved father, but my brother's behavior did the trick. Poppy stood and walked toward my brother until he was about three inches from, my fa from his face. You listen to me, he warned. You don't talk like that in front of our daughter. You hear me? Eric shook his head, glaring. You're not my father, he muttered. I don't have to do what you say. All at once, Poppy grabbed Eric by the t-shirt. You watch your mouth, he shouted, as the two stumbled from the stove and the fridge. In this house, you're gonna show some respect. Right then, Mommy leaped from the chair and tried to wedge herself between them. That's enough, she yelled. Calm down. Eric stomped from the kitchen to his bedroom, slamming his door so hard, I think the milk in my bowl swayed. I was too scared to speak or make a sound. I didn't have the maturity or vocabulary to explain it back then, but I knew why my brother was unhappy. Eric was furious about the way his life was turning out. He'd been cheated out of having a birth father. While my parents showered me, their princess, with love, Eric felt like a misfit in his own family. 
My dad's intentions to protect us all were honorable, but he made his views clear. I was his baby girl, Eric was his stepchild. Also, at the same time, my parents didn't know how to address the mental health and behavioral issues that my brother faced. Because communities like the one we grew up in wasn't something that was talked about or afforded. Mental health was a luxury. Depression and anxiety are devastating burdens. There's so much pressure to be happy and bubbly and to keep your chin up. Reaching out and asking for help is brave. I wish we lived in a world where more people were given support to do that. Poppy had his own sore spots. I could see how much he wanted to make a nice home for us, to make his risk of coming to America turn out to be worth it. He was also still recovering from the pains he'd experienced when he was Eric's age. I don't think you ever quite get over such devastation. Following my father's death, following his father's death, my dad had to become a grown up overnight, the responsible one. He wanted to pass on a similar sense of responsibility to my brother and couldn't understand Eric's rebellion. As for me, all I wanted was peace. That fight ended the way they all did, with my parents blaming each other. You're babying Eric, my father yelled at my mother that night. Let him grow up. There I sat in my small rocking chair in our living room, watching helplessly. The fighting worsened until mommy, her face covered in tears, grabbed a box of buttons near her. She lifted her arm to hurl it in dad's direction. The buttons, big ones, little ones, dozens of them in different colors and shapes scattered across the floor. Stop it, I screamed through sobs. Stop it or I'll call the police. Silence fell over the room. My father slid down into the couch near me. From the chair on the other side of the room, Mom gave, Mommy gave me a blank look. For as long as I live, I will never forget what she said next. Go ahead and call the cops, she whispered, her voice raspy from the yelling. She paused. Then they can come and send us all back to Columbia. I gazed at her, but I couldn't bring myself to respond. My thoughts raced as I tried to make sense of what I just heard. Finally, I asked, what are you talking about, mommy? Tears stung my eyes, blurring my vision. What do you mean they'll send you back? She shifted forward in her chair and dropped her head. I mean they'll deport us, Diane, she said. They'll take us all away from you. I stared at her, then over at my father, and then at mommy again. By this point, I already knew my parents' legal status. In fact, I don't recall a time I didn't know they were undocumented. In our house, that was just understood, a fact of life. But at seven, I hadn't known what their status could mean for me. For the first time, I realized that with a single phone call, I could lose the most important people in the world to me. After midnight, my parents kept arguing in their bedroom. I hated it when they fought. It made me so anxious. What if they never stopped fighting? What if they stopped speaking to each other and we never sat down to dinner together again? What if they split up? Sadness weighed my heart. In the dim light of my corner in the living room, I rose from my little mattress and turned on a lamp. At the foot of my bed lay a large nylon dress-up bag. My costumes were inside, a jumble of tiaras and bright metallic fabrics. I put on my princess get-up, a pink gown. Mommy's heels, the one she wore a mask, sat near the couch. I slid in one bare foot at a time, wobbled a bit, then stood up straight. On this night, I would be Molly or Olivia, or Taylor, or Emma, or any little white girl who had it easy, whose parents never bickered, whose brother didn't hurt, whose family would never in a million years be pulled apart. There in my land of make-believe, I could always find a happy ending.